Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first public debrief of the Barrack Plenary 2022. We had our plenary meeting last Thursday and Friday, and we had, as you may imagine, one special item to start the agenda with, and that was um, the implications of the war in Ukraine for our work and the way that we can help make sure that we as Europe manage this crisis as best as we can. What we did was we discussed the situation. We also discussed the first prelim preliminary results that we had, a preliminary analysis of our experiences with the open internet regulation vis-a-vis -vis the sanctions by the EU on banning Sputnik and Russia today. And we decided upon giving further clarity to the operators on the fact that, of course, the open internet is not an obstacle in implementing the EU sanctions. And to make it understood that Barrett reads these obligations in a broad manner and that all websites belonging to the entities mentioned in the annex fall under these sanctions. Thus, we hope that we have given the clarity that operators have been calling for to reduce regulatory uncertainty. We have also discussed the various initiatives by the operators to help the refugees by, for example, offering free roaming, by offering SIM cards, or by helping by putting antennas up in the regions closest to Ukraine to make sure that those people who have had to flee can connect back to their loved ones. We have noted that our Polish NRA UPA has been in close contact with its Ukrainian counterpart to make sure that there are no spectrum or frequency issues or problems on that respect. And we have welcomed all the actions and also noted that they are unfortunately not yet implemented by every operator. So we have, we are, we have expressed hope that these voluntary measures will be implemented more broadly and for a longer time as this crisis, unfortunately, is continuing. That, I think, sums up the discussions that we had in plenary, where we have also invited our colleagues in IRG, Ofcom and Comcom in Switzerland to exchange experiences with us on a technical level. And we've decided also to reach out to our colleagues in ERGA and to have discussions with the operators as well as with our Ukrainian colleague. And those actions are being undertaken this week and next week. And we'll, we'll be continuously in contact with the relevant authorities as this crisis continues to proceed. I think that sums up what we have been doing there in the hope that we also are helping restoring connectivity between the EU and Ukraine as best as we can and reducing regulatory uncertainty for the telco sector. With that, I think we can, as we have last Thursday, resume to our more regular agenda and where we will have presentations in two parts. Part one will be on implementing, part one will consist of several presentations after which we will have a Q&A session and then after we will have a second part of presentations and again room for questions and answers. 
I see that uh, there is one question about VPN providers. I think that our communication vis-a-vis -vis providers are not meant for one specific category of providers. It is just to help underline and clarify the way in which VERIC members will apply the Open Internet Regulation and the extent to which um, these fall under Article 3.3 of the Open Internet Regulation. Um, so this is, I think, a general guidance that we hope to provide to the sector. Uh, and as we are neither implementing nor enforcing authorities, either as individual NRAs or as BEREC, as a European body, uh, we have had no further discussion on which parties exactly should adhere to these sanctions. So I do not think that BEREC is the relevant body to be analysing this question. I hope that answers that question. And we can move on with part one. So I would like to invite our co-chairs from the Open Internet Working Group to start sharing their presentation. Klaus and Dirk, you have the floor. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Good afternoon on behalf of the Open Internet Working Group. Together with my co-chair colleague Klaus, we present you today the draft update to the BARAC guidelines on the implementation of the Open Internet Regulation and the explanatory document on the public consultation on these draft updated guidelines. Next slide, please. Where do we, where do we come from and where the journey will go to? This journey started in September last year when the European Court of Justice issued three rulings regarding a violation of the European Open Internet rules. Then in October, Barak invited stakeholders to contribute to its analysis. Barak was very grateful for the valuable input received and we took, took note of it when updating our open internet guidelines. The scope of these guidelines is limited to the impact the rulings have on Barak's guidance on zero rating. The update has been prepared in a close collaboration with the European Commission. Now we are pleased to launch the public consultation on the draft updated guidelines. The public consultation will run until 14th of April, 5 Central European time, and we very much welcome contributions from various stakeholders to the email address indicated on this slide. Please note also that for information purposes only, we have prepared a track change version that includes a comparison to the 2020 version of the guidelines. Further information on the public consultation is available on the BARAC website in the section of the public consultations. The next step will be in June to publish the final guidelines, the consultation report and the non-confidential stakeholder responses. My dear colleague Klaus will now provide further information on the, updated, on the update proposed to the draft guidelines. Thank you. Many thanks, Veronica, and good afternoon also from my behalf. I think the message is rather clear on how we understand the implications of those ECJ rulings. Zero tariff options are incompatible with the obligation to treat all traffic equally. And that the obligation is not limited to technical traffic management practices. And it also applies to ISP's commercial practices, such as different edit pricing. This means that non-application agnostic practices are likely to be inadmissible. As an example of those offers, I can also mention practices such as generating ISP's own applications or CAP subsidizing their own data. Aga sponsored data. As said, these 
I would like to make very clear that uh, there is still room for price differentiation. Then all traffic is treated equally. In the draft guidelines, we provide examples of typically admissible practices that are application agnostic. And I would really like to emphasize the notion application agnostic, because these examples are all application agnostic. These examples include, for example, zero rating traffic during a certain time period, providing different quality of service levels, providing different bundles, contractual lengths, data volumes, providing different prices for different user groups, for example, school children, and providing a low application agnostic bit rate after the data cap has been reached. That would allow, for example, accessing the customer service to purchase additional data volume. We also believe that the exception A of the Article 3.3 may, may apply to non-technical discriminatory measures. For example, to a certain application free of charge. We do not use notion of public interest in the guidelines, as this is a matter for national lawmakers. Next slide, please. Here we would like to present you briefly the main changes in a nutshell. We have updated some legal references due to the European Electronic Communication Code and the ECJ rulings. Some of them were added, but some were just updated. In the previous guidelines, we had plenty of guidance regarding zero rating and non-application agnostic practices that is now removed. Of course, we also needed to add some further guidance on how to assess the different edit pricing practices. And as I mentioned, we added also some examples of typically admissible practices. As the DCJ rulings were mostly about the equal treatment and, and zero tariff option, so it's not probably a surprise that we have added some further guidance also regarding this. And after all these changes and updates, we also saw that one paragraph handling the comprehensive assessment for less clear cases wasn't anymore needed. So that was also deleted. And in the end, we have added some further information and guidance regarding how to apply the exception A. Next slide, please. Now, regarding the explanatory document, it gives background about the guideline update. It gives information about the public consultation. But I think what you find most interesting are the two last sections. The first section described the proposed major clarifications and also our rationale why we are proposing them. And the last section describes Perec's reading of the ECJ rulings. And I could maybe highlight a couple of points regarding our reading. ECJ ruled that zero tariff options as such violate the general obligation to treat all traffic equally. The ECJ did not assess the individual app limitations of use as they are incompatible with the equal treatment obligation by the mere activation of zero tariff option. And that the incompatibility remains irrespective of the form or nature of terms of use. It is also good to note that Vodafone Pass did not contain any different DID traffic management measures. And the ECJ did not limit the interpretation of Article 3.3 to zero tariff options associated with different DID traffic management. The reasoning of ECJ expressed in its considerations is equally binding as the operative part. And in Berex's view, the 21 rulings are in line with 2020 ruling and constitutes a clarification of those principles set in 2020. In 2020, ECJ only decided on the referred questions. However, 21, the ECJ clarified this further and decided not to 
answer only the questions referred by the German courts, but also clarify the 2020 ruling on its underlying admissibility of zero tariff option as such. As a last point, I could add that the interpretation given by ECJ is applicable retroactively from the date interpreted provisions entered into a force, unless the ECJ limits the temporal effects in its ruling. And this wasn't the case in 21 rulings. We would be very happy to re receive your feedback regarding the draft guidelines. So please be welcome to send any comments and, and, and remarks you might have. That was all from our side, and I would like to pass floor to Katarina Sandrine. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, my colleague Katarina Dekanoska and I are very pleased to present to you today two new documents prepared by BEREC addressing ICT sustainability. They constitute first results of BEREC's new activities on sustainability since the setup of a dedicated working group in 2020. We can go to the next slide, please. So to begin, we would like to recall the context of the edition of these two documents. Uh, next slide, please. In the light of EU and international environmental targets, BEREC strategy identifies sustainability as a high level strategic priority. BEREC recognizes the massive positive role of digitalization achieving environmental goals, including uh, climate neutrality. However, the critical importance of digital solutions to decarbonize other sectors of the economy does not prevent the sector itself to do its own environmental transition. As a result, BEREC has been committed working on ICT-related objectives of the Green Deal and UN Agenda 30. This work includes bettering and erase knowledge on ICT's adverse impact on the environment, including uh, telecom networks and services, and to identify relevant ways to reduce and mitigate this impact. To fulfill these objectives, BEREC Sustainability Working Group has been mandated to work on the realization of two documents presented today. First, an external study that provides an extensive literature review on the topic, a map of actions reported by operators from the sectors to mitigate the adverse impact of uh, telecommunication on the environment, and some analysis on levers available for national regulatory authorities to act on sustainability. The study was realized uh, by the consortium uh, WIC and Rainbow. And secondly, uh, the, uh, the second uh, document we are presenting today is BEREC's report assessing its contribution to limiting the impact of the digital sector on the environment. The initial version of the report is open for public consultation until April 14 and comprised results of activities led by BEREC on sustainability, including the above mentioned uh, external study. The two main goals of this report were to identify actions taken by stakeholders and including other relevant authorities and uh, bodies uh, on uh, the topic of ICT sustainability to avoid uh, duplicating the work and also to provide an outline of possible new activities for BEREC in the area of sustainability. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, shortly, you can see on the screen the complete, complete structure of BEREC's draft report uh, on ICT sustainability. As you can see, it is made up of six uh, chapters, including uh, an introduction on the background I just uh, shortly described, as well as uh, conclusions at the very end, drawing some conclusions on possible future activities for BEREC on sustainability. We can go to the next slide, please. So now we will dive into uh, the core part of BEREC's uh, draft report and present some of the key results uh, from this uh, document. We can go to, thank you. So firstly, um, I will present some, uh, some of, I will comment some of the key figures uh, from uh, the draft report uh, as well as from the external study. So according to a range, a range of studies uh, reviewed uh, in uh, the literature review, the ICT sector represents uh, between uh, 2 to 4% of global greenhouse gases emissions. 
Devices account for 60 to 80% of uh, ICT carbon footprint. Data centers uh, for 15 to 20% of the share and networks between 12 to 24% of this uh, share. So the range of figures is explained by two main reasons. First, there is no harmonized methodologies yet to evaluate the different scope of emissions um, related to ICTs. Secondly, data availability and accuracy are quite a challenge due to the lack of standardized data collection on the topic. Uh, besides, there is a consensus on the fact that the carbon footprint of ICTs has been growing uh, in the past few years, but the exact uh, trajectory is subject uh, to debate because of lack of predictability. Berek also notes uh, in this, on this regard, that uh, greenhouse gases emissions are the most used framework to analyze ICT environmental footprint, but they are not the only relevant indicators to consider while evaluating uh, this uh, adverse impact on the environment. Indeed, energy fossil sources consumption and depletion of metal and mineral resources also constitute environmental challenges associated with digitalization, calling for multi-criteria assessment of ICT's environmental footprint. We can go to the next slide, please. Although sustainability is a new topic for telecom regulators, some first actions were already taken by NRAs to mitigate uh, these adverse effects on the environment and uh, contribute to twinning connectivity with sustainability. So in our draft uh, report, you will find three extensive case studies on RCEP, Traficom and Comreg, which have pioneered dedicated agenda to promote ICT sustainability. There are also other first initiatives led by other national authorities that are mentioned in the draft report. Uh, if the majority of NRAs do not have legal power to act on sustainability directly, there are also some other possibilities to act anyhow in the traditional remit of telecom regulators, including infrastructure sharing under EECC and civil work coordination under uh, the, broad, broad, the Broad Cost Reduction Directive. Next slide, please. Berek also published first contributions on ICT sustainability with some first interesting results highlighted in the report, including a summary report on the series of workshops organized in October 2020 by Berek with external experts, as well as Berek's opinions on BCRD recast and on state aid guidelines for broadband revision that both tackled the topic of telecommunications sustainability. Uh, many thanks for your attention. I will now leave the floor to my co-chair, Katerina Dekanowska. Thank you, Sandrine, and good afternoon also on my behalf. In order to learn more about initiatives led by various other entities and to avoid possible duplication of work, Berek held a number of bilateral meetings with wide range of parties. We talked to EU bodies, to partner international organizations from the sector with civil society and consumers organizations and with industry associations. We also discussed with other working groups within BEREC to explore the possibilities of a holistic approach to the topic and to search for cross-cutting issues. In general, the consensus was reached on the positive effects of digitalization on other sectors' decarbonization, but also on how significant the environmental footprint of digital technologies, especially devices, and of the manufacturing phase is. From among the possible levers where Berek could contribute, the stakeholders mentioned data collection, incentives for the sector, and consumer awareness mechanism. Next slide, please. I would like to present you now the main conclusions uh, stemming from the report. Um, I'm not sure if we are having the correct, the correct slide. Yes, thank you. Now, next slide. Thank you very much. Berek has already planned initial works on data and indicators to be able to take part in the process of identification and definition of indicators to assess the environmental impact of ECNs. This work stream will begin in the second half of this year. 
Greg also understood that there are already some existing regulatory tools for environmental targets that could be applied in certain situations. Some NRAs are already exploring the applicability of the Article 44 of the Code and spectrum management rules, but expectations are made also about the currently revised BB cost reduction directive and state aid schemes. And our race could also refer to encouragement to mitigate, to, more, uh, pardon, to migrate to more energy efficiency, next generation technologies. Other actions could be made in order to assess the common criteria of what it is a good practice for limiting the environmental footprint of electronic communications and to use data-driven approach to promote end users empowerment and to raise awareness on the impact of devices, services and certain uses of most sustainable practices. And more potential activities of course are outlined in the report. All these actions should be done in good collaboration with other relevant parties. Next slide please. The BEREC report, assessing its contribution to limiting the impact of the digital sector on the environment, was now opened for public consultation. We will be collecting contributions from stakeholders until 14th of April, as was already said. It is possible to submit the contributions by means of the EU survey tool. Within this process, we prepared a workshop for interested stakeholders, which is scheduled for 4th of May, uh, April. Pardon. We will present the report in more detail and provide there also some additional inputs to the topic. During the rest of the month of April and in May, we will analyze the inputs from received contributions and then present the updated report for approval to BEREC decision bodies in May and June. So the final publication is then expected for the second half of June. Thank you very much for your attention. And now we will hear an invitation from incoming BEREC chair, Mr. Konstantinos Maselos. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. Good afternoon from my side as well. It is a great pleasure for me to have the opportunity to present um, our planning as regards the work program for 2023. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as you might have already seen, in late January, Berek published its outline for the work program 2023. And this outline includes First, the mandatory regular tasks that BEREC needs to execute in 2023. Um, you would expect that. The work streams, second, the work streams that are included in work program 2022, but are planned to be concluded within 2023. Also, this is a natural and obvious choice. And third, some topics that were foreseen in the work program 2022 as potential areas BEREC could work on after 2022. Taking this into account, we invite all stakeholders already from today to submit us their proposals as regards the topics in which BEREC should dedicate its resources during 2023. This call for input will last for one month and we consider it to be a very important milestone in the design of our work program. BEREC's website includes details on the relevant process and I, I invite you to have a look at it. Apart from the brief presentation I'm giving today, we will very soon have the chance to exchange on Work Program 2023 during our annual stakeholder forum, which is planned to take place next week, March 23rd. I will give more information about this in, in the next slide. Stakeholders' input that will be provided according to the above will be analyzed internally together with the input we will receive from our members and our experts with them to prepare the detailed draft work program for 2023, which we will adopt for public consultation in the beginning of October, October the 6th. This public consultation will be another chance to receive useful feedback from our stakeholders. BEREC, after analyzing this feedback, will finalize its work program for 2023 in early December 2022, and we will start preparing for its execution. As you understand, Stakeholders play a very important role in the procedure and we are looking forward to receiving your ideas and proposals throughout this interactive process of consultations and preparations for work program 2023. Next slide, please.
Coming now to the upcoming BEREC event, I would like to invite all of you to participate in our stakeholder forum that will take place next Wednesday. The event will take place physically, but remote participants are also very welcome. The event webpage includes useful practical information. I urge you to visit it for your registration if, if you have not done so already. Via the web page, you will also have the opportunity to submit any questions that you would like to discuss during the forum. Next slide, please. Before closing my presentation, I would like to give you a short overview of the topics we will discuss next Wednesday during the stakeholder forum. The event will start early in the morning with the meet and greet sessions during which registered stakeholders will have an opportunity to exchange ideas with the BEREC Working Group co-chairs about the particular topics BEREC deals with and the challenges in the sector. Please note that the meet and greet sessions only take place physically. Following this, the conference will start at 2 p.m. and will include five thematic areas. First, a session to discuss around work program 2023 and the engagement with stakeholders. Second, a session that will focus on Europe's digital decay policy program with a presentation by the European Commission. The third session focuses on artificial intelligence with a panel bringing together policymakers, industry and consultants experts in this field. The fourth session covers digital platform regulation and specifically the Digital Markets Act with another very interesting panel. The final session will focus on sustainability with a presentation of the relevant BEREC study that was finalized very recently, as you already heard. We are very excited that we will have the opportunity to see you again, most of you in person, very soon and exchange on this very interesting topic. So please don't forget to register. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude my short presentation. I will now hand over back to Anne-Marie, who is ready to open the first Q&A part of this debriefing. Thank you. Thank you, Kostas. And I am also looking very much forward to our stakeholder forum and meeting all of you, including our stakeholders, live in Brussels. For this Q&A session, we have two questions. Um, one pertains on the first part, uh, and it's from John Palmer asking, does Barry give technical guidance on blocking, for example, DNS blocking or IP blocking? I, uh, as I have stated, we, uh, BEREC, nor the individual NRAs, are um, either implementing or enforcing authority in this respect. Um, the enforcement or implementation of these sanctions are very much outside our remit. The way we try to facilitate the operators um, is through giving guidance on how we view the open internet regulation in this respect. So our guidance given, given in our uh, brief statement on the Barrett website only pertains to the relationship between the open internet regulation um, and on the one hand and the sanctions on the other hand. Um, so no, we are not giving any technical guidance. We, however, we have hoped to have helped in giving this guidance on open internet by providing some concrete examples of what we may envisage will happen in reality. But this is where our technical, our guidance uh, ends. That is on that aspect. And there was also a question from MVNO on the present work program 2022. Um, as MVNO Europe has marked that the report on wholesale, wholesale mobile access connectivity is not in the final work program, um, but delegated uh, to an external consultant. And the question is, will this topic keep the same focus and priority? Actually, this move from the program from the work from, from a work stream regular work stream towards the chair study was made between p3 and p4 so this was already in the work program on p4 and as i said um, this study is the chair study so i would be actually the last person to say that this means it gets less priority i think uh, for my part it means more priority and focus and it was done 
uh, for two reasons. One, we wanted very much to have this, the chair study focus on this issue. How do we see the developments um, in wholesale mobile market with the advent of 5G? How do we see new business models developing? On the one hand, and we saw an overlap with the regular work stream from the mobile uh, working group. And they were suffering from quite a strong workload. So we decided to combine those two and have first the fact finding part uh, in the form of a chair study. So no, this is not to have uh, a different focus or priority, but rather to start with a fact finding a study uh, to make sure that that work keeps on going and does not suffer in the prioritization that was needed in the wireless expert working group. So I hope that takes away any concern MPL might have on the importance of that topic for better. With that, we have no further questions on any of the presentations. So I thank our presenters. Very um, clear uh, presentations and also I think very clear that there is going to be ample time via public consultations to uh, contribute their, their views and insights to you and to help you further work on these very important topics. So thank you very much for that. Um, we can now move on to our second part, which will start with uh, a presentation from our co-chairs who are responsible for drafting the barracks response to the public consultation on the revised state aid guidelines for broadband networks. And this was a cooperation between two expert working groups. So I uh, give the floor to the combination of Lars Erik, Wilhelm, Begonia and Julia. You have the floor. Thank you. Also, um, a good afternoon from on behalf of the Fixed Network Evolution Working Group. The European Commission launched the public consultation of the draft revised European Commission guidelines on state aid for broadband networks on 19th of November last year, and it closed this public consultation on 11th of February. The BEREC response to this public consultation consists of two parts. Part one is on the draft revised European Commission guidelines on state aid for broadband networks, except Annex 1 mapping. And part two is on Annex 1 mapping. Part one has been prepared by the Fixed Network Evolution Working Group and part two by the Statistics and Indicators Working Group. The main points of part one of this BEREC response are as follows. The role of NRAs in granting state aid. Eric is of the opinion that it needs to be considered to make the consultation of the NRAs in the design of state aid measures mandatory in the foreseen areas, which are identification of target areas, assessment of step change, wholesale access, products, conditions, and pricing, and dispute settlement and conflict resolution mechanism. Beric is also of the view that the member states should ensure and not only be encouraged that the NRAs are provided with sufficient resources and competences. Market definition. Beric is of the opinion that the member states should also have the possibility to combine fixed mobile and backhaul networks into a single stated scheme. Next slide, please. Market failure. Beric does not share the European Commission's view on the definition of market failure. However, Beric's position on the definition of white, gray and black areas and the definition of step change for these areas mainly results from other and further considerations independent from market failure. Beric agrees with the definition of white areas and the principal definition of gray areas. However, Beric considers that the regime for black areas will likely result in a severe distortion of competition and crowding out of private investments 
except in very specific circumstances which may arise in the future. Step change. Beric agrees with the definition of step change for white areas. However, as already mentioned before, Beric is of the opinion that the member states should have the possibility to take mobile networks into account in case of stated for fixed broadband networks, in particular in rural areas. The reason is, in such areas, a mobile network may be a more cost-effective solution. Berrick sees some issues with the definition of step change for gray areas and considers it necessary to adapt the definition of gray areas slightly in order to ensure investment recovery on the existing networks. In case of black areas, as already mentioned before, Beric is of the opinion that state aid in principle should not be possible and therefore there is also no need for a definition of step change for these areas. Design of host access conditions. Beric is of the opinion that any state aid scheme should have horses access conditions attached to it in order to ensure the best outcome in case of delivery downstream competition. All horses access obligations may be required in principle. However, the NRA should have the possibility to adjust the set of horses access obligations, for example, taking into account the principle of proportionality and the remedies imposed under the European Electronic Communications Code. Next slide, please. Design of holders access prices. Beric welcomes that the pricing principle continue the practice of the current EC guidelines on stated for broadband networks. However, Beric considers it necessary that the wording of the pricing principles will be adjusted slightly. Otherwise, there is a risk of a severe distortion of the pricing systems implemented. The reason is, the European Electronic Communications Code does not refer to cost orientation and only one further costing methodology, but instead to more than one costing methodologies. In the guidelines for local authorities, <clears throat> Beric notes that the new provisions with regard to NRA guidelines for local authorities provide more flexibility for NRAs. <coughs> Sorry. Technological neutrality. Beric welcomes that the guidelines follow the principle of technological neutrality. However, Beric wants to point out that in case of horse access conditions, which depend on media technology and network architecture, an unrestricted application of this principle doesn't seem to be possible. Use of existing infrastructure. Beric wants to point out that if the scope of the revised broadband cost reduction directive would be limited to very high capacity networks, then this may have a negative impact on state aid. Beric is of the opinion that this should also be considered in the revision of the Broadband Cost Reduction Directive. Reporting obligations. Beric is of the opinion that the ENRAs should also be a recipient of the report that the member states have to submit to the European Commission every two years. The reason is this report also includes information on the competitive situation in the member state. Next slide, please. Social and connectivity vouchers. Berg welcomes the possibility of social vouchers. And in case of connectivity vouchers, Berg considers that it is necessary that the potential negative impact on competition and investment is minimized. Climate and environmental impact. Beric welcomes that the guidelines encourage member states to include also criteria on the environmental impact in state aid granted projects. Beric is of the opinion 
that the guidelines should also assist the member states in defining indicators for network operators to report the environmental impact on the, of the planned network deployment and mitigating measures. And Varex and DNA's expertise on the sector should be taken into account when defining these indicators. Final provisions. Beric is of the opinion that the final version of the guideline should also include an appropriate transition period in order to allow ongoing projects to be finalized under the current regime for reasons of legal certainty. General block exemption regulation. Beric considers it necessary that the general block exemption regulation will be aligned with the final version of the guidelines with regard to certain specific aspects, for example, the duration of hosted access condition and hosted access prices. Now I hand over to Julia, who will present part two of this Beric response. Thank you, Wilhelm. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, on behalf of the Statistics and Indicators Working Group, as well as um, on behalf of my colleague, Begonia, I'm going to introduce to the main points that, that we made regarding the Annex 1 on mapping. And just to, to, to remind and to set a bit the, the scene, um, this Annex uh, is meant for mapping for state aid purposes and aims at objectively representing the achievable performance characterized at least in terms of download and upload speeds, which can be relied upon under peak time conditions for fixed as well as mobile networks. Um, the, the first section in, in part two of the BEREC response uh, deals with the role of the BEREC guidelines developed according to our, uh, the provisions of Article 22 of the code and also other provisions from the uh, code. Uh, very important is to note the importance of Article 20, 21 and 22 of the code in delivering information relevant uh, also to state aid notifications. So Berek believes that the draft state aid guidelines should include mentions about the purposefulness of these articles when uh, requesting data, including um, at a geographically detailed level. The second point that we make in this, in this category relates to the geographical surveys of network deployments and to the fact that um, in Barrack's view, this should be the primary data source uh, for state aid. And therefore, Annex 1 should uh, come to complement where there is further need or insight into data um, for, for the um, design of state aid measures. In any event, Barrack holds that only one broadband mapping should be uh, promoted. Concerning the granularity of the information, given that um, Art Annex 1 prescribes a very detailed level, this means address level for uh, fixed networks and fixed wireless access networks and address or maximum 100 by 100 meter grid for mobile networks. Um, in order to align with the provisions of the code, uh, Barrack holds that an adaptation period should be allowed until um, 23rd of January, uh, until December 2023. Coming to the proportionality aspects, um, Barrack has shown in its response that the information to support state aid intervention depends on the specific specificities of the measures. And therefore, we believe that public authorities should uh, be allowed to design proportionate data requests. Uh, therefore, based on the geographical surveys of network deployments, if the data which is available already is uh, considered sufficient, um, the duplication of data requests should be avoided by all means. If we go to the next slide, please. We also have a section dealing with planned deployments and forecasts. Um, since the approach envisaged by Annex 1 
uh, concerning the plan deployment and the forecasts uh, imply the same level of data granularity as for the actual or current deployment, uh, BEREC calls for additional standards which would enable the collection of less granular data, uh, taking also uh, due account of the fact that for longer, the longer the forecast period is, um, the less uh, detailed data would be available. Furthermore, uh, if data on future deployment is already available in the geographical surveys of network deployment, BEREC sees no need to require again the same information. And therefore, the public consultation mechanism, which is envisaged um, in the draft state aid guidelines, should be focusing, focused only on validation of the existing results. And then we finally, we have a section dealing with other aspects whereby um, we ask for the use of the same definition for the premises past concept as in the BEREC guidelines. And we also see clarification uh, regarding some terms um, in the peak time conditions characterization. And uh, this would be it from our side. Thank you from, uh, for your attention. And I'm passing now the floor to Chiara and Jorge to prevent, uh, present the latest updates in their group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. And uh, well, now uh, is the time for, for the very report on the regulatory treatment for fixed and mobile backhaul. The, the, many of you will remember the report was subject to public consultation uh, two plenaries ago and what, what you see now is the final result of the public consultation, both the final report and the, the summary of responses and better reactions and, and considerations of that. So if we move to the next slide. Just to remind you very shortly the context, we were preparing the report because we all know that BAHOR is especially relevant for the deployment of 5G and we are now in the phase of deployment and also very high capacity networks in especially in rural areas, etc. And there was a new recommendation in December 2020 on relevant markets with this issue, um, especially on mobile buffer, was specifically addressed by, by the Commission. So, motivated by that, we decided to prepare a report on what was the situation at the European level, and we sent uh, to complete questionnaires to MRAs and operators. All BEREC members uh, responded to the, to the questionnaire, and even six observers. And we got 60 responses from operators where we were looking not only qualitative views, but also quantitative information that we considered that was useful for everybody, not only for NRAs, but also for stakeholders to know especially how things are evolving. We had a workshop uh, here and the report was open to public consultation in October and November. So, if we move to the next slide, uh, we receive 11 responses. As you can see here, many of the key associations of, uh, of operators uh, were providing feedback. And we also received from, from some operators in Italy, the Netherlands, several from Germany, and one group, the Vodafone. Um, so, if we move to the next slide, you can see here a very short summary on the feedback from the stakeholders. You can find it there in the in the summary of responses, also with better reactions. So, in general, some of the of the stakeholders were telling us that there was no need to regulate Bajol and they were raising different issues, that it was not included in the recommendation of relevant markets, that the broadband cost is enough, a potential increment of, uh, of investments. And on the other side, we, 
to the atoms, so the bills on a skin for having it specifically regulated, and even in the case of, of that, when we would have it clear to maintain regulation on those uh, countries where it is regulated. Uh, that is around and depends in the reparation half of uh, So our feedback, essentially, as you have seen probably in the report, we are claiming always that this is a case-by-case -case analysis. So in general, it's very difficult to say this shouldn't be regulated or this must be regulated. There is a need for a case-by-case -case analysis to be done by the NRAs, and even if it is not in the recommendation of the markets, say in other markets, you apply the three criteria test. Uh, essentially, we are reminding on that of all the potential issues of the retail mobile markets that places were backwardly regulated, you should apply a modified greenfield approach. And on the sufficiency of the broadband co reduction directives, it depends on national circumstances because the use of it is different in each country. And we are reminding that even maintaining regulation that should must be justified so you don't maintain regulation by default. Uh, there were comments on the Italian and German cases where Beric as such does not enter. We will refer to the corresponding NRAs who are the nose or the ones who know base. Uh, there was also a request on, to have a more fine-grained analysis, both on the analysis on the information provided by operators and on NRA regulation. Uh, essentially, on, on both the data we, we have collected that not allow for distinguishing in, in, in more fine detail. For example, in operators, we have 60, but if you have more categories, etc., and in the, the, the number of operators, uh, it's very short to, 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 to be significant. And on uh, in the race, same, we, we couldn't go further with the information we collected. And after all, the report was not focused on showing each national case, but showing the general view. Uh, on the common position of potential future common position, there were mixed views. Uh, some of the stakeholders were telling us that was beyond the Berek task because it was not included in the recommendation on, on urban markets. And that's what asking us to prepare as soon as possible a common position. So it's mixed views. You will see in the summary that consider that in or not in the recommendation of the markets doesn't mean that you can or you should produce a, a common position or not. Uh, there are common positions on many different issues. And on, on having in an early stage, we consider that it's good to, to have experience applying the new recommendation of the markets to have a solid base of best practices, feedback from the Commission, etc., in order to pro provide that robust common position. So, at the moment, in the short term, uh, we, we are not prepared. Does it mean that in the future, seeing how things are evolving, etc., we may consider it? Um, and I think next slide. Well, first of all, to thank the eh, stakeholders for the input, the input because it's always valuable, and you can be sure that it raised discussion. When you see in the summary the result of internal reflection, etc., and it's always welcome because it's good to be forced to to reflect on, on issues. A story. In general, the responses were very focused on, on the general case of regulating battle that was not the purpose of the report on, on that, and we consider that this a case-by-case case analysis. So you can see the feedback in the summary, but in the, in the report, really, we were not um, entering into that general uh, case. So, so our feedback is mainly on, on the summary. And in the final report, what you will see is that we have adapted some wording to, to avoid some misunderstandings, 
footnotes, for example, on some of the inputs that we had on the interpretation of, of the responses, because we had uh, responses from operators that were alternative in one country, but they couldn't in other. So it's true that that, that should be interpreted with cautious. And that's all. Next slide that I think that, yes, that's all. So I pass the floor to Mike. Thank you, Farhad. Um, thank you very much for your explanation on the final report and the way you handled the public uh, the results of the public consultation. There is one question that has been brought to our attention before this session. Uh, Christian from the University of Namur asked, will specific attention be given to the application of Article 76 by NRAs? Would further guidance be provided on what is a new infrastructure? Parta, do you have a short answer? University of Numbers. Yes. Well, first of all, Christian, thank you for uh, for the question. I mean, a specific attention. We, we are always paying attention on on, on the application, on guidelines, etc. Uh, perhaps more than formal to prepare a formal report of how it is applied, etc. There is nothing besides in the short term. I think that there is something more important. That is that the experts in the, in the groups are the ones who uh, later applied that. We had long discussions, not only among us, but also with the Commission and came to, to an agreement. And we are permanently in, in contact among, among us. And when, I, when I received the question, I sent some mails here, there, I, I received responses. And we are of course paying uh, attention but if the sense of the question is if we are to prepare a kind of uh, police report of how we are applying etc the answer is not a, is a by by now and i think that is same on, on the other question on further evidence on new infrastructure that was subject to a lot of internal discussion to to come up to to an agreement if needed, uh, in the future, we may consider to go further on, on this. As now, it looks that at least for regulatory authorities applying it, etc., is adequate what we have. But let's see, because it's only application of, of, of the article, and we are in an early stage. There are some cases at the Italian, and we may have more cases. And in the future, uh, we may perfectly evolve guidelines based on feedback we may receive from NRAs applying, telling us, hey guys, we should uh, do this or, or that, and also from stakeholders. Uh, so, I mean, BREC is not a separate entity, it's us uh, NRAs. So, I think that more or less that's. I don't know. Christian has anyone to go further? Thank you, Jorge. Um, I think there is one more question. Um, as Costas has presented the program for the stakeholder forum, one part was considering the DMA. And the question is, can Barry give an update on the state of work on this report regarding effective enforcement of the DMA? And how has Barrick been engaged in discussions on the institutional and governance aspects of the DMA? Kostas, can you maybe say just a bit more on what will be discussed next week in the stakeholder forum? Well, thank you. Thank you, Annemarie. Um, next week, we, I mean, we all know that DMA regulation is in the final stages of being approved so at some point, maybe towards the uh, the first half of uh, of 2022 so what we want to do is to have a latest update of the status of the discussion on DMA since Berek has been very actively involved in the consultations on, around DMA especially in 2021 where we defined where we uh, presented our our view and our vision on the regulation and on the role the NRAs of electronic communications could play 
in the enforcement and implementation of DMA. So what we want to do is to have a latest status update on the discussion of DMA next week. Thank you. And I think with that we have also the question whether Barak has been involved in discussions on the um, NICS, that is the number independent interpersonal communication systems, uh, interoperability with the European Commission or with the co-legislators. And is there upcoming work planned on interoperability under Article 61 of the code? That is a question pertaining to the um, uh, that is, uh, they, these are two questions. On the first, yes, we have been uh, last year uh, produced a very opinion, especially specifically on the sub the topic of interoperability, and we have been um, alerting uh, all the parties involved in the final discussion on DMA. So that is the Parliament and the Commission of Barrick's work and position and insights in this respect. So we have offered those opinions. So in that case, um, we try to contribute to that discussion, but as Costas already explained, it is also largely at this stage, um, a trilogue between those three parties in the European arena. And there is um, work where we have started a uh, first uh, exploratory um, analysis on cases that may have been taken on board by NRAs uh, on interoperability under Article 61 of the code. As you may be aware, the code has had some delays in being implemented throughout the member states. So Article 61 is not yet uh, relevant in all member states. So we are trying to get a grasp of who is working uh, and what is the status at this moment, but that is very preliminary at this point. I am so happy that we have so many questions at the end. There is one more. Can Barrick provide some insights into his discussions on international collaboration at the plenary and what are his priorities for 2022? Yes, we had a presentation from the Planning and Future Trends uh, Working Group uh, who were presenting um, the proposal for international collaboration following our strategic uh, plans that we adopted, our strategic document that we adopted last year. Um, and this will be uh, finalized in the list uh, and the implications for 2022 uh, and will be discussed with the European, European Commission and will be published in due time. Um, that calendar will, um, with a, a calendar with events, will be published somewhere later this month. So that is coming your way. I hope that that answers all the questions that we have today following our first plenary. Any questions that you may have specifically concerning the work program? next year and various priorities can will of course be addressed next week at our stakeholder forum where if you have registered you are also given the opportunity to meet our co-chairs live in brussels with the meet and greet in the morning thank you so much for being with us today thanks to co-chairs and costas for pre presenting all their work so far hope to see you in brussels and in any case, at our next public debriefing, after plenary two. Thank you and goodbye.